It really depends on who you get for it. It absolutely does. A little more. Because I haven't I haven't really liked the class, but so you guys get up all next week? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we're good. When I was in school, we didn't get a fall break. We got so three days. We got to go to Wednesday. No fall break for you at all? Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, so they consolidated everything? Yeah, we've had four weeks of class for the last 14 That's weeks. rough. Yeah. yeah. It's a rough time. Uh, South Dakota has not joined us. If you want to wait a couple minutes, no depending way. on how many slides you have, you can't. If not, we have to push forward. It's all right. My slides aren't that important. We can only skip over some. Okay. So, will they, when will we know? Will they pop when up they, over here? When they pop up on the screen. They use a five minute rule there, I guess. I just got them live, so. This is the semester. So Chuck, you said their test is open notes. That's all the slides. You're going to give them all the slides and they can highlight all this stuff? Yep. Too easy on these graduate level students. That is true. That is true. I did tell them to write a few things down last time. I hope they listened to me. It's almost like I also wrote part of the test. That is true, too. Hey, that's <laughs> is that the YouTube? Yeah. All right. All right, just do what you want to do. Okay, we'll go move on. If South Dakota joins us, great. By the way, I, the weather today was ridiculous. I woke up and it was, what, 68 degrees outside? And by the time I got to work, it was like 54 degrees? Oh, well. All right. Well, now I have problems over here. What's going on? All sorts of problems. Sorry guys, I lost my presentation here, so give me one minute. Maybe South Dakota will join us between now and then. Chuck, which Wi-Fi works here? Do you know? T U guest. T U guest. Yeah. Just go to T U guest, and then you got to go to their uh, log on page and just hit OK to accept. Gotcha. Yeah, already good. Oh my goodness, we're already good. Yeah. All right.
Here we go. Well, I'm almost in the VPN, so we'll see. I already had a load and everything, and it still doesn't do me any good, so. Oh well. It's loading up now. All right, so while it's loading, last time we talked about basics of TO, kind of focused more on the general outline of the mechanics, kind of what a, what a TO system looks like, what a vessel looks like where the fire goes, where it comes out, things like that. Like I said, it's kind of more focused on the mechanical aspect of things, give you an overview of kind of what the shape and size of the systems look like. Today we're going to talk a bit more about the chemistry. So for you chemical engineers, it's probably a little more interesting. Uh, for mechanical people, that probably more remote. Uh, maybe not as interesting or maybe a little more challenging for you. I need to work a lot to, is this the most recent one? Yeah, well, one yeah. Okay. Well, now here it, here it is. Oh, that's vapor control. I mean, that's, the, that's not even the right one. Sorry, it's easier than I have one screen. It keeps sending things to the other side. Okay, back in business. All right, like I said, we're going to talk more about the chemistry of things, talk about 
Again, thermal oxidizers are there for our pollution control or emissions limit device. So talk about what we're trying to control specifically more often than not and how we do so with this particular piece of equipment. Remember yesterday, a TO was really there to help break up mostly organic compounds or, or chemicals that are left over in the chemical process of these facilities that are making product, whether it be gasoline or plastics or whatever it may be. Remember yesterday, too, we talked about those three T's of combustion, time, temperature, turbulence. We probably mentioned that in half our courses because it's so critical to what we do. In terms of pollutants and things that we're dealing with, primarily we're talking about unburned hydrocarbons. This has become a big deal, especially lately. Talk about methane being released, all these gas wells in the U.S. especially, as well as elsewhere. Um, how do we control those, those hydrocarbons? A, so we're not polluting, and B, how do we cover those so we can make that into product? Also, we hear a lot about CO, NOx, greenhouse gases, those are the big two. <coughs> Particulates, you know, obviously particles, carbon items, um, other types of heavy metals and things like that that happen to get to our systems. And other things like halogenated compounds, like chlorinated systems, fluorinated, things like this. So why, why do we care about these things? Anybody have an idea why we care about burning those things off? Pretty obvious, I think, health reasons. I mean, obviously burning some of these nasty things, if you were to bring these in, would make you sick or possibly even kill you in some cases. Obviously, they, they you know, add to ozone issues. I was in Shanghai last week, and I can tell you what, a clean day in Oklahoma is a lot different than a clean day in, in that part of China. A big part of it, and also just the global environment overall. There's obviously a lot of factors that play into this. So that's why we have to deal with these things. Otherwise, we have to deal with things like this. This is a result of acid rain in the Rocky Mountains that has occurred in the past. Uh, this you know, smog contributes a lot to this, where the particulates actually get to the rain. Also, too, here's an example of what acid rain has done to a statue that is located in Italy. This thing has existed for hundreds and hundreds of years without any real issue. You can tell after the Industrial Revolution of, of that era, you can see what damage it did just to that stone. So you know, just, a, just a visual impact to what's going on, of course. The much broader things than trees and statues being uh, impacted here that we have to worry about. So CO, that's, that's one of the easier ones for us to deal with. We do a lot of CO. It's one of the primary that we, we have to meet usually some sort of emission requirement for our equipment and to prove to the EPA or whoever, hey, our equipment's working. Uh, it's relatively simple, though, dealing with CO. Usually we can achieve breaking of that C in the oxygen molecule by just getting it to a hot enough temperature. Once we get to about 1,500 degrees, that's enough energy to break those two apart and make sure they convert um, into H2O um, or carbon emitted by itself into atmosphere, basically unobstructed from that point. So good mixing, good airflow, right temperature, that's going to take care of our CO requirement in most applications. If we don't have that good mixing, we don't have that good air, air uh, um, supply to it, that's where we get the incomplete combustion that occurs and we don't get full conversion of our, our chemistry of the methane and oxygen molecule in this example. So we want almost all of this to go to CO2 if we can. Now, NOx, NOx is a little more complicated, and this is a, an emission that really has come under scrutiny over the past 30, 40 years, and it's become really what we focus a lot of technology development on is reducing NOx in the system. So we're talking about NO and NO2, we talk about NOx, so we just put the X to make it mean either one of those two. So when we're dealing with our burners, we have some strategies to, to work with this, but let's talk about what type of NOx there are, because there's really three main types. Prop NOx, thermal NOx, and fuel NOx. And prop NOx, as the name entails, it is a NOx that forms very quickly in the oxygen and, and nitrogen compound mechanisms where we're heating it up. Uh, basically, it happens we don't have enough air available, and the free radicals mix together with the nitrogen, and we generate this, this NOx particle very, very quickly. This makes up a relatively small amount of the NOx that we produce in a system. Uh, but it is one of the, the players if you, of, of our NOx formations. Here is a chart that you absolutely must memorize for your final, I'm sure. Not really. Uh, this is actually just an example of 
the various chemical reactions that can occur when we have fuel coming into play when there's air, oxygen, and actually, of course, within the air available. So this is just showing the various chemistry and chemical reactions that can occur. And when we're talking about burner combustion, we're trying to basically control as best we can which of these reactions is happening when. So think about it that way. We're just trying to control which reaction's happening when, and sometimes that means we'll limit how much oxygen is available so we can control which maybe uh, chemistry is happening, or maybe we'll give extra oxygen. So we're just trying to control which of these is being generated from the process. Okay, it's just a visual of what's going on. The next one, thermal NOx. Thermal NOx basically occurs when we hit high temperatures, hit high heat. So thermal is a good kind of adoration for that. So basically once we get to temperatures within our flames, 80 by flame temperature of 2,500 degrees or higher, that's when we have enough energy to start breaking apart the triple bond molecules of nitrogen and mix it within, within the system. So we have to be careful when we're having our systems. Heat is very good, of course, for controlling carbon and other types of uh, emissions, but we have to be careful because then it begins to impact our thermal NOx profile, which is a critical item for us to control in our combustion process. And this is where most of the NOx is generated within, within our, our TO systems and most burner systems as well. So when we're dealing with NOx, we have several strategies to help reduce this. Obviously, it's, it's generated within the flame temperature itself, so obviously controlling that to the right limit is going to be key. So cooling that flame is really the, this key strategy of controlling this. And we can do that through staging where these fuel gas injection ports are being mixed so that we'll have fuel hitting it every so often. Even just you know, inches of difference can make a big uh, impact on the flame temperature itself. We'll also use high excess air. So we're gonna bring our combustion air system or, or pushing air into this system. So obviously air is relatively cool relative to the flame. So that's gonna help cool that. We may also use water or steam where we're gonna just really inject that in a spray, some sort of pattern into that flame. And how we do so, of course, can help control that. And in boiler bars and applications, we use flue gas recirculation. We simply recirculate this waste over and over again. It's actually completed combustion once. We'll send it through again to help basically treat it over and over. So this is what we primarily focus on when we're doing burn design, trying to implement these various strategies to control that flame temperature. The last key item of NOx formation is fuel-bound NOx, and that's basically when we have fuel in the actual waste itself. And for thermal oxidizers, we tend to have several systems that have to deal with this. So we have several items that deal with ammonia, um, hydrogen cyanide, Within a lot of coal industries, there's typically a lot of uh, ammonia-bound compounds in those. So we have a lot of systems that we, we have to address it when it's within the actual waste itself. So not only is it available in the air, hey, it's hitting us in a fuel source. So we have to be very careful how we inject our exothermic fuel gas or fuel waste into the unit. Of course, not all systems have to worry about this. If you're just burning natural gas, generally this is not a problem. So like I said, when we're, we're, we're dealing with NOx, and we're dealing with low NOx burners, it's all about controlling that flame temperature. A few systems here. We may also use some catalysts or other sort of post-combustion, which I think you had a course on post-combustion already. SCR, SNCR, sound, sound familiar? Okay. Just for your information, here is a chart that shows the impact of NOx on your y-axis in regards to flame temperature. So like I said, as you go up in flame temperature, the NOx begins to shoot out. So we have to be very careful about that. So we know that based on this, we have certain limitations of what the flame can look like and temperature wise. Here's some photos actually based on that previous chart just showing the same burner in the same sequence and it's just actually going up in temperature. So you can just see that how that flame temperature, uh, color, shape is impacted by the, the same flow rate but at higher temperatures within the unit. So we're cutting back the air in this case. So within burners, I'll just cut to this. When we're dealing with the burner, uh, this is what, uh, one of our examples of an ultra low NOx burner, which is really our, our best available technology right now for thermal oxidizers. And there's a few things that are going on in this design. It's hard to see kind of in this photo here. But basically, 
within this kind of turbine looking thing, each of these spindles or veins coming off have hundreds of small ports of gas ports. So we're actually injecting that waste along those gas ports there. And that is doing several things. A, it's, it's part of that staging principle we talked about. So instead of one main burner shooting one flame jet, we basically have hundreds that are located all around this. We also have air coming behind this. The combustion air is coming behind these veins. And of course, that's going to allow that air and fuel to mix, A, for combustion, but B, it also helps cool the flame since we have direct interaction with that air and that fuel right away. That's that kind of attacking that prop nox that could be occurring. And so this burner has relatively short flames as compared to a burner with a single tip down the center like we talked about on Tuesday. So this is what we call an RMB burner and some of our ultra last burners. Here's some CFD, maybe, oh, I hit the wrong button. Don't hit bottom, because that's going to send you to the very end. Here's a CFD showing, this is that burner itself. It's actually firing down if you, you think about it this way. So this zone right here is where those little veins are at. So this is where that fuel is being injected with that air. And so we have a, what we call a rapid mix section. It happens very quickly here because of those veins interacting with that air right at the exit. But we also have what we call these recirculation zones. And so these are basically zones where we're creating eddy currents to help the flame kind of recirculate back on itself. And so what that does is it actually creates this cooler outside shell air and ambient condition mixed with the hotter temperature occurring in the middle. Remember yesterday I showed you some of those CFDs. It pretty much showed a hot flame down the center. Well, this helps prevent that a little bit by pulling in the outside cooler air that's on the, basically the outside of the vessel and pulls it back to the center to create A, better mixing, which is good, but also B, cooling the flame, which is good for NOx. We actually do it twice, so once in this initial section and then once again out here. So that's how we'd handle it when we're burning basically like natural gas. But like I said, sometimes you have to deal with it when it's in the fuel itself. So this is a real example we have of a unit, I think it's in Ohio. Um, I think they're an asphalt plant, if I recall right, making shingles and things like that. And they actually have several, you can see all the highlight sections, several wastes that contain nitrogen within that chemical makeup. You can even see some of the various chemistry items there. And so we have to deal with that. And that's not as simple as just burning it in that low NOx burner because it's within the fuel itself. So there's some other things we have to do to basically get the nitrogen out of the waste before we treat anything else. So one of the ways that we deal with this is through what we call an oxidizer system. And this is a three-stage process. And this process is done, if you recall, because I mentioned we're trying to control the chemistry reactions that are occurring. I showed you that, that chart with the kind of flow diagram. And so basically, when we're using this system, we're using various injection points and oxygen and temperature set points to basically control what's occurring at one given time. So generally, these systems are three stages. Uh, stage one is reduction zone, stage two is a quench, and stage three is reoxidation. So what does that mean? So the first stage, reduction zone, this actually is a substoichiometric operating point within our unit. So stoichiometric is having just the right amount of air for perfect combustion. Usually within us, we actually use excess air. So we're actually more than stoic. We'll use, say, 15, 20% excess air to make sure we get a good enough mixing. In this case, we're specifically reducing the temperature or reducing the oxygen available to get very, very high temperatures. And high temperature is bad, right? That, why would I do this? I told you high temperature is bad. Well, this is only phase one. So this first stage, we're trying to get all of the nitrogen-bound compounds broken apart from the hydrocarbon they're related to right now. Okay, So we're not worried about the output yet. We're trying to get what's coming in. Let's get all the nitrogen separated out as much as we can, as best we can. So we get the very, very high temperatures. It's a very, very high intense mixing environment and relatively short. We only operate here about half a second typically. Normally we're a full second, but half a second. So we're basically just trying to do the first stage of breaking apart those nitrogen molecules coming in that are mixed with other hydrocarbons or things like that. So once we've done that, we have to prepare that 
current state of gas to then go into a normal type of, of combustion process. But we can't do that right away, because if we give it air, it's going to get really, really hot again really quick. It's going to get hotter than we already are. We'll make a ton of NOx. So the second stage is a quench section. So before we were at 2,000 degrees, 2,500 degrees, now we're going to shoot some, some steam or air with that, that waste. And we're going to cool it back down, say, to 1,100, maybe 1,200 degrees Fahrenheit. And so this is just really getting it ready for the next stage, which stage three is reoxidation. So this is basically we're going to actually put air back into the system. We're going to be over, you know, we're going to be stoic, even probably 20% excess air, as we would say. And this will help us basically burn everything else out that we have and keep our flame temperature below that adiabatic flame temperature that generates NOx. So this is where we're basically taking care of everything else. So now that we've taken care of the nitrogen-bound compounds, we're taking care of everything else at this point by re-injecting it with oxygen. So here's an example of what that looks like. Waste gas coming in, it's got nitrogen in it. We've got usually natural gas fuel. We'll be in a reduction furnace or substoic. We may inject some other items too, but typically we don't. We have a cooling section. That's where we're injecting either air or steam. And then we'll get to this point where we actually go to re-oxidation, so we're bringing in another combustion air blower and getting back to normal operation like you would on a typical TO. There may be a boiler on the back end, maybe not. That's just an option like we talked about before. And then you're out the stack. So stage one, two, and three. Here's an example of what it looks like. It's kind of a mess to see it's in a photo, but actually the burner is here, firing that way. So this first stage here is the reduction section. There would be a combustion air blower. There's probably two of them. One's applying the combustion air here. Here's the cooling section. So we had a limited plot space. We had to make it to a U. Um, here we're injecting steam right at this elbow. That's going to mix with that. And then here we have combustion air that comes in again from the side. And we have our final set of combustion that occurs there. You guys talked a little bit about post-combustion. You had a whole hour on that, did you not? Yes. So we actually use post-combustion within our groups, too. Um, we use it in addition to what we do within the flame. NOx is one of those things that really we can get to a low NOx limit as we need to for any given application. It doesn't matter how much money you have, all right? It's just time and money. Uh, we can always get there. It just means more and more things you to throw at it. So in some cases, we may have this, this NOx dodger system, and it gets us to a certain NOx limit, but oh, we need to add post-combustion on there as well. So we also use these types of post-combustion systems within our units. Um, I won't go into too much more detail, but we use exactly the same formula as everything else. We use an ammonia injection spray, and we can either do that with a catalyst or without a catalyst. Here's an example of one being shown on thermal oxidizer. In this case, we have our kind of vertical combustion section. And there's our ammonia injection. And then we can either go out the stack, or in this case, we're covering some fuel. That's how we can do that sometimes. We have to be careful, though. If we have too much ammonia, you get what's called ammonia slip. They may have mentioned that before. And that's obviously bad, because then you get pure ammonia out the stack, which is obviously not our goal. We spend a lot of times, too, when we're dealing with these, obviously the CFD, how we inject that, making sure it's perfectly even as much as we can is a critical aspect of, of our post-combustion systems. Just a reminder for you, since I got the slides here, SCR is selective catalytic reduction. So that's when we're using a catalyst with it. Catalysts can be various shapes and sizes. You guys, you see this photo last time they show you this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they call these cassettes. So all sorts of different designs and companies that use these and different types of material that we use to basically absorb and, and get NOx emissions even lower. OK. This chlorinated section, this is actually probably one of the most difficult applications that we have within our product group. And I'll talk a little bit why, because it's not just the chemistry item. There's a lot of mechanical considerations we have to worry about. So chlorinated compounds, it's usually any, any item that contains a bit of chlorine. Uh, we deal a lot with the vinyl chlorides, methyl chlorides. These are usually as part of facilities that make plastics or silicone. 
Uh, I've been to two facilities in Freeport, Texas. Uh, one of them makes kind of high-end, unique silicones, the ones you buy at Home Depot or even more unique ones than that. There are several in the U.S. and around the globe, of course, that make uh, plastic pellets that are melted down into all the things that you guys use that are plastic in this room. So they'll actually begin the process of converting these, these coated items into literally plastic pellets. They ship tons and tons of these out per year. And they come in bags of little beads, basically. So when they're making these things, and PVC pipe, that's another common one they use as well, the plastic pipe you, you see for you know, lawn or your piping at home. So when they're making these products, the, the vinyl chloride items that they're using are critical to the application, but obviously at some point there is a waste they have, and that's what we have to deal with. And this stuff's nasty. This stuff can, can cause significant damage to you from a health perspective. as well as to the environment. So when we're actually building these systems and designing these systems, there's a number of items we have to be very careful about. So here's a diagram of what a chlorinated system looks like. And I'm sure it makes no sense to any of you. In fact, it barely makes sense to me of what's going on here. Uh, but like I said, this is one of the more complicated pieces of technology that we, we use because there's several steps that we have to go through to treat the waste coming in to allow it to be either recaptured as a pure chlorine item that they can use in product or captured so that it's not emitted to the atmosphere so only the good things are sent out. So I'll break this down a little simpler in a moment. So when we're talking about our objective as a thermal oxidizer is basically to combust all the hydrocarbons, so all the H items that are part of this, and break it apart from the chlorine item. We're going to separate these two. Okay? So what we're going to, our goal ultimately is to either capture the chlorine or turn into a salt that we can then dispose of in a container or something like that. Those are the goals. So there are several things and steps that we do to get there. So here is a typical chlorinated system. We have this right here, which is the same as everything else I've shown you before, our thermal oxidizer. We then go into a quench section. Many of these have what's called an absorber, which is where we actually absorb some of the chlorine and reuse in product. Then you have a scrubber where we're turning these items into a salt, and then go out to the stack. So I'll talk about how we get through that. I have a video here that I think I'll come back to after I've walked through this, so you can kind of walk through it from a visual perspective. I could talk all day, and a video probably even sells most of that. But let me tell you what you're looking at before I show you what it is. So like I said, here's a general breakdown of what's in a chlorinated system. I kind of showed you this already, so I won't get into that. But like I said, when we're dealing with chlorines, we're having to, to work through various set points to get the chlorine broken apart from the hydrocarbons. And the step one, again, is putting it through our, our, our burner. There's our burner here. Um, since we're dealing with chlorine, MOC is material of construction. We have to be very careful what materials we use. Most of our burners are made from stainless steel. It's very good for, for, for temperature resistance. It's very good for chemical resistance. It's generally what we use, I'd say, for 80, 90% of our burners. But for chlorine, it's very corrosive to everything. Uh, carbon steel can last hours, stainless steel may last days, so you have to look at other materials. In this case, we're saying Hastelloy, there's other ones called RA, uh, rolled alloy, or uh, there's Haynes is another brand name. Very unique materials that allow us to have a sturdy enough design that is not eaten alive by this chlorine present in the waste. So they're very expensive. But we can actually build our standard, that, that R&B burner I showed you before, we can use those. We have other options depending on it if we need to worry about low NOx or things like that. When we're dealing with the chlorine, again, we're trying to deal with that methane, that chlorine atom, along with the oxygen and air available. And generally, this is what we have to worry about here, right? These are the items that we're trying to deal with, all the items in blue. Those are the, the products of combustion that we have to then capture or retreat some other way to get them out of the system. Because we can't release this pure chlorine into the atmosphere. You inhale that, it's going to knock you out, could kill you. Okay, imagine being in a swimming pool times a thousand, right? That's inhaling that kind of chlorine to you. 
So we're trying to deal with that chemical process. One thing to be careful too though is as we're going through this process, when that chlorine mixes with the water vapor and other items in the air, we can get acid dew point or get to our dew point and create an acid within our system. So we have to be careful of controlling the temperature of the shell throughout the whole system. Because even those high dollar, um, very boutique metals will still have problem. And our refractory itself also is impacted by that. So we have to be very careful about controlling a specific temperature in the first section. So this first section, we're generally around 1600 degrees Fahrenheit to begin the initial process of breaking apart the chlorine from the hydrogen bound compounds and the, the, the um, various carbon items as well. From there, we've kind of got everything split apart. Before we can do anything else, before we can treat it further, we have pure chlorine in the system and we have to be very careful what we do with this. And what we want to do is we want to capture some of this chlorine most of the time. We want to keep it back and turn it into, again, a salt or pure chlorine itself so they can reuse it in the plant. And before we can do that through these, these absorbers and these scrubbers here, we have to cool it off. We have to condense it down to dew point itself before then. And so to do that, we use what's called a, a quench system. And all this is is basically an array and various injection points of usually water is what we're using. And we have spray nozzles and also some that cascade down the wall that basically create complete coverage of this section of the, the system to mix and cool everything down to dew point. Now I just said getting dew point is bad in the earlier section, right? I said that's very corrosive. So why am I purposely doing it now? Well, at this point, we're changing materials. At this point, we're actually no longer using typical metals. This section here, you can see here the materials of construction. We're using zirconium, which is a very unique material that, by the way, you can't weld in open atmosphere. You get to weld in actually zero oxygen in atmosphere, which is very interesting, um, or hassaloy. And then down here, once we get below this, we change to what's called FRP, which that's just a fancy word for fiberglass. So we're no longer using metals. We're using fiberglass from this point forward because we're at low temperatures. Um, fiberglass we can't use earlier because it melts. But once it's cool enough, it's great, it's very stable, it's not um, impacted by the corrosive nature of chlorine. So from here on in, the rest of the system, we use this fiberglass material, which is kind of unique. Most of our things are big, heavy steel, very industrial looking. Here we're changing this fiberglass material. So we're changing the temperature. The goal of this is to get down to, say, 600 degrees Fahrenheit at this point. And again, the reason for that is, is that in this next section, what we call the absorber, we're going to do what the name entails. We're going to absorb as much as we can of the pure chlorine. So it just came out of that quench section. It's coming into here now. And it's going to basically transfer through this system vertically out the stack. Inside of here is what we have random packing. You guys heard about packing from some of the other groups. It's basically, and there's all sorts of trademarks and unique you know, uh, proprietary items people have, but it's pieces of material that have all sorts of geometry and shapes to get interaction with that gas. And we're going to shoot water downward to cool it even further. And the goal is to bring that chlorine to dew point and have it come out the bottom. From here, we can pump out that chlorine and reuse it in the plant and they can make more product out of it. Okay, so we're trying to basically save them money. They're going to recover this and, and use it again in the facility. All the while, all the other hydrocarbons and everything else, they're going to be going out the stack. So we have to be very careful of controlling temperature. They don't drop everything to dew point, we only drop the chlorine to dew point. And we can actually achieve as much as 90% of the chlorine removal from the system and recover that. Again, this is all made of that fiberglass material. So these towers are two, three stories tall, made from fiberglass. OK, so we've gone through and absorbed as much as we can. Now we, need to, we still may have a small amount left that we have to deal with. We can't recover everything. And 90% is usually our max. And that's, generally very expensive to do that. So there's a kind of a cost uh, benefit we have to look at in terms of how much packing do we use and at what point is it no longer economically feasible to keep making this thing taller. Okay, everything else we're going to have to deal with some other way. 
So after we've gone through and absorbed as much as we can, we put it through a caustic scrubber. And by the way, not all systems have the absorber. That's an economic decision. But all of them do have the scrubber. So after we've come through, we've ducked it over, we're coming back down. Now we're going to go through the caustic scrubber. Similar system. We're going to come in here. We're going to go through a packed bed like we did last time. But this material is usually a little different. It's a different type of material because we're doing something different with it. Here we're actually spraying in a, a particular like a salt brine mix. This is not water, pure water. It actually has a salt mix with it, a caustic material. And we're going to spray that down, and then we're going to have what's called a mist pad, which just is one final cleaning, and then out the stack. And so what we're doing here is we're actually spraying the salt in it, and this salt reacts with the chlorine. Here, here's our, our injection fluid. And it's going to react with the chlorine and give us water and a chloride salt material that we're going to have to deal with. And so this collects at the bottom, and we can basically recover this salt and, again, dispose it somewhere else or reuse it somewhere else. So at this point, we're getting anything that's left because we really can't have any chlorine. So all of this being converted to this, this chloride salt material. So this is what we use for the final check to get the last of the chlorides out before everything else goes out the stack. So a lot of chemistry going on here. We're doing a lot of different things. Again, they're trying to control what's going on through that process. So hopefully this makes a little more sense. I'm going to go back to that video real quick because I think it does a good job. It's cool to see, A, what's going on from a, a 3D perspective. But hopefully, too, it makes a little more sense in terms of what's going on inside the system. Hold on one second. I have it somewhere else. Any questions about looking this up? Does it all make sense to you? It took me about five years to figure this out, so you're better than me if you got it by now. Sorry, it keeps kicking that over there, doesn't it? Chuck, I promise you, my other presentation was perfect. We didn't have these problems. OK. So here's that video. So it's going to basically walk you through that whole process I just showed you a second ago. it should. Here we go. And this has a low NOx burner on the front end, but this is actually indeed a, a vinyl chloride plant. So this will show you both that RMB I showed you with the rapid mixing, as well as all this downstream equipment that we've been talking about. And this is a, actually two systems that are mirrored together. So we have our combustion air that comes in that's supplying our, our air for our initial process. Our fuel gas coming on to light our pilot. Which then increases to be ready to light the main burner. First section, we're, we're about 1,500 degrees Fahrenheit. This one actually has a boiler, which most of them don't, but there's a boiler there that's just recovering some of that heat. And here is that scrubbing system and absorber. You can see these materials inside. 
these ones are more like a saddle design. On the right side, they're what we call a snowflake, just different proprietary items that vendors have created over the years that maximize the surface area as it mixes with it. This one they're worried about what's called a, a plume coming out. So we actually had the mister that helped take out some of the additional basically items that can actually make a small cloud, if you will, that comes out. So we actually absorb it within the, the demister there. And they actually put an SNCR on the end before they went to the stack. So this has basically everything as an option in it, but just going to kind of give you a visual as you walk through it. So that's a chloride system. Uh, sulfur plants, generally speaking, when we have any sort of oil or coal, things like that, that's used to make gasoline, we have usually, typically, there's, there's H2S, or sulfur compounds within that waste. And we have to deal with that. And most of these plants are called SRUs, or sulfur recovery plants. And in this system, we're basically doing a similar thing, kind of like we were with the chlorines. And we're trying to basically turn these into a, a, a solid form of the H2S, this pure sulfur, so they can recover that and use it elsewhere. Whether it be they use it for fertilizers, they may use it in other sorts of uh, chemical processes, so we'll sell this off. So everything in blue are basically technologies that John Zink helps support. You saw the flare group there. We have several other heaters and burners in this system that we use from our side to deal with these, these sulfur compounds. So we call H2S compounds acid gas. I'm not sure why they got the term acid gas and all these other nasties didn't, but they did. Uh, we call them acid gas or sour gas. And so we're bringing those into our thermal reactor. Our thermal reactor is a fancy word they use in the SRU process for basically a thermal oxidizer. So this is the same kind of setup. We have a burner, a fractory line chamber. We're burning in those initial H2S compounds. From there, what we're trying to do is we're trying to, again, break up H2S, turn it into SO2, which occurs during the initial combustion chamber. And then there, once it's an SO2 form, we actually then to begin to condense it out to recover it. So we'll cool the flame down with a boiler and we'll run it through a condenser, which is basically like we saw in the absorber. We're shooting a little bit of water into that. We're basically going to then condense the sulfur compounds out. And that can recover as much as 30 to 60% each time we do that. So some of these may do this, they'll reheat it, go through the reactor again, and do it again. And they may do this two or three times each time to recover slightly more of that, that sulfur compound. And how many they do it depends, again, on economics. At what point do you say this is enough? The rest of it's just garbage, OK? So we're going to burn it through, condense it, reheat, condense it, reheat. And then from here on out, this is all basically um, being sent to what we call our tail gas system. So this is the exhaust pipe of the plant. This is actually another thermal oxidizer, very similar to this one. But in this case, our goal is just to burn off as best we can anything else that's left. So we're getting a very, very small amount of, of H2S at this point as compared to early in the system. Anything that's left, again, we're just trying to convert to as low of emissions as possible from that point forward. So again, just a burner with a combustion chamber and out the stack, typically. So this is basically, this setup occurs in basically every refinery in the world. There are a few in the US and some elsewhere where they have very, very clean oil that they don't need to worry about this. But almost every plant in the world has a very similar setup as this. And of course, if any of this stuff goes wrong and they can't use it and it's going bad, there's a pluggage problem, everything goes to that flare and makes that really cool tall flame. So if you're ever on the east side of town, I'm sorry, west side of town, west side of town, um, kind of over by where Oktoberfest is and things like that, or with OSU Medical Center, you see those refineries there, take a look for the flare. You can usually tell how well the plant's going. If there's a big flame going on, it means it's a bad day for some operator in that plant. So they got a problem. So that's what's going on in the system. Again, we're trying to recover as best we can. And anything else that's left, we're getting out to atmosphere. 
So we don't always destroy everything. We are recovering and doing some good for our system, not just a trash can, but in the end, we're just trying to make sure that anything gets to the atmosphere is things that you can breathe. And I had a few more slides, but I lost that revision, so we're not going to go through those. So I guess with that, do you have any questions about these items we talked about today? Any questions about TOs from the other day that may be on the test or anything else? This is the last class, right, Chuck? Yep. Anything else make sense? You guys make it out of here, don't you? Mm -hmm. A little early. A little early. Anything else? All right. Thanks, guys.